mười lắm xin chào hai thầy của nghe không cảm ơn nghe rồi rồi căng thẳng đang ở mô đó cùng mười à opening remarks uh, professor uh, nguyễn sĩ huyền nguyễn yeah. anh đợi cho anh đợi cho anh huyền chụp Okay. He's there. Okay. Oh, Professor yeah, Sihuan Nguyen. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, xin chào. <cười> xin kính chào. Và là xin uh, trân trọng giới thiệu uh, giáo sư tiến sĩ Nguyễn Sư Hiên. Chủ tịch Cơ hội Tim Mạch Đức Việt sẽ có đối lời phát biểu trước chúng ta vào hội thảo khoa học. Xin kính mời. Dear Professor Min, dear college, dear college of the German Vietnamese Association of Cardiology, it is a great honor for us to be back in Vietnam virtually for the second time this year. Of course, We don't just want to be in Vietnam virtually, but right alongside. Unfortunately, COVID-19 did not favor us, so we have to wait patiently for this beautiful day for a while. We have a long-standing partnership of more than 20 years with the Hue University Medical Center and the Hue Tu Tien and Khan Hoa Heart Association, which we want to continue and from which COVID-19 does not data us. Now, we are very pleased to be able to present a wide range of topics at your conference today. On behalf of the German Vietnamese Association of Cardiology, I warmly welcome you and with the conference every success. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Nguyen. And so uh, it's a great pleasure for me, dear organizers, dear professors and colleagues in Vietnam and Germany, that I'm here to moderate this uh, elusive um, uh, session here within the uh, German Vietnamese uh, Society of Cardiology. And the first uh, presentation is from Professor Dr. Jan Malte Sinning. He's the chief and the head of the Department of Cardiology and Rhythmology in St. Vincent's Hospital in Cologne, and is a real specialist in uh, coronary artery disease and structural heart interventions. And today, his presentation is about percutaneous treatment of free vessel and left main disease, state of the art. Yeah, good, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, dear Professor Nguyen, dear Dr. Nguyen, dear professors and colleagues in Vietnam and Germany, it's a great pleasure for me to be um, uh, again part of this interesting um, German-Vietnamese collaboration and association and to give a lecture here at your um, Heart Association Congress in Vietnam. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Nguyen um, for the kind introduction and um, I want also to thank him for the great partnership we have together at uh, the St. Vincent's Hospital in Cologne together. And now it's my pleasure to give a talk about a percutaneous treatment of three vessel and left main disease, state of the art 2021. So the first question is, who did the first left main PCI, who invented it? And uh, it was back in 1977 um, in Andreas Grünzig's times And the fourth patient he treated um, by uh, a PDCA was actually a left main patient, as you can see here, and with a very nice final result. I mean, of course, this was in the pre-stand era, and things changed a lot since then. So pictures say more than a thousand words. 
let's start with an example from clinical routine. Here we have the coronary angiography of an 81 year old gentleman suffering from NSTEMI. And as you can appreciate here in the proximal LAD and also in the in, uh, part of the left main, we have severe calcifications and uh, this makes up together for a syntax score of 32. So what to do now with this gentleman? Um, let's ask the gu European guidelines. Um, as you can see here, um, there are several uh, options and ways how to decide if a patient should undergo cabbage or PCI. At the end of the day, our patients with a syntax score of 32 and a left main uh, um, stenosis has a 2A recommendation for PCI. But in the end, at the end of the day, the heart team should be considered and um, also the patient has to be uh, adhered uh, if he or she does want to undergo a cabbage or not. So this is a very important uh, point in this discussion. And here you can see the German consensus on, um, uh, on the guidelines and um, our patient would be a 2A recommendation for PCI. But if the syntax score would be only one point higher, then we would have a 3A recommendation. So we should not uh, treat this patient with PCI. But as you have seen with the age of 81 year old and uh, um, he was very frail, I think there's no doubt that after heart team discussion, this is a typical PCI patient. But to start with, what evidence do we have for three vessel and left main disease in these times? The mother of all studies was the syntax trial. And here you can um, again see the one year results published 12 years ago in the New uh, England Journal of Medicine. And as we can see here, after one year, there was no mortality difference between PCI and cabbage in um, coronary artery disease patient. Also not regarding stroke or MI, but as you can see, and as we all know, um, there was a tendency for uh, significantly higher repeat revascularization in patients treated with PCI. But what happened after 10 years? And here you can see um, the continued uh, syntax one study. And um, uh, here we can see the Kaplan-Meier curves for um, all cause death. And only three of these, this is the only uh, um, sub uh, um, type that remain with a significant mortality difference over 10 years. Even patients with diabetes, there was no mortality difference between PCI and cabbage. And also for left main patients, as our patient here in this example, there was at least no uh, mortality difference. What can we do if we don't have enough studies to um, find a valid uh, answer to these questions? Then we can do a meta-analysis. Um, meta and here we have a very nice analysis from the Lancet three years ago published um, about three vessel disease. Here you can appreciate taking um, 7,000 patients from 11 randomized controlled trials that we have a mortality difference after five years. But again, if we do this meta-analysis with more than 7,000 patients uh, from these RCTs uh, regarding the subtopic uh, left main disease, we don't have any mortality difference after five years as we have seen in the 10 year syntax one trial results. So, what we do have to ask ourselves is if these trials still represent standard of care. Um, if we go a little bit deeper into the study data, then we have to admit and we see that syntax score was used to quantify disease complexity. In most of the studies you can uh, um, see in these meta-analysis, early generation drug eluding stents have been used um, that we would never uh, use in these times. There was a very low rate of FFR or IFR guided strategy. We had a low rate of imaging guided PCI optimization at the end of the day. And the rate of complete revascularization was quite low, only 57% in the PCI arm of the Syntax 1 trial. And um, what we have to talk about is that only low risk patients have been included in these studies. And these higher risk patients we have to deal with in our clinical daily routine haven't been included. So I think. I don't have to say anything more about the syntax uh, um, score. If it is still appropriate for decision-making in these times, that's a question we have to ask ourselves. I mean, um, it was introduced by the Syntax 1 study group uh, more than 10 years ago to quantify disease complexity and to, to quantify coronary anatomy. But 
if this is enough in these times based on a geographical uh, assessment only, that is a major question. And just one example for uh, um, the benefit of next generation drug eluding stents that are clearly superior to early generation DES was the SPIRIT 4 trial even uh, also published 11 years ago. And as you can appreciate here, uh, uh, benefit of almost 40% regarding maize. So um, it was a lot better than the Puckley Texas stents uh, used and the Texas stents used in the Syntax 1 trial. And if you take a look at FAME 1, um, a study that evaluated an FFR guided PCI strategy to um, compare to angiography guidance only, we also see a clear difference with a reduction of nearly one fourth regarding maize. And even in this study, um, mortality could be significantly reduced by 42%. <clears throat> Another thing we learned from the FAME 1 trial is that angiography alone is inaccurate in assessing the functional significance of coronary stenosis when compared with FFR. And as you can see in this nice uh, um, diagram is that stenosis between 50 and 70%, only one third is functionally significant when measured with FFR. And this part increases um, if the diameter stenosis also is higher in patients. And I mean, there's no doubt that a stenosis um, above 90% diameter stenosis has not to be evaluated by FFR, but especially these intermediate stenosis um, are very often false positively um, assessed by the um, operator if only um, assessed by uh, angiography. And what this study showed is that patients with angiographic three-vessel disease and these have been um, four, uh, 509 patients, at the end of the day, only 46% had functional multivessel disease with more than two coronary arteries uh, assessed with an FFR below 0 0.80. Another thing that hasn't been um, included in these uh, older studies that I've shown to you is that intravascular imaging decreases the rate of target vessel failure. And, as we can very nicely see in this ultimate trial published three years ago by our Chinese colleagues, and the use of IVAS in uh, um, PCI optimization was able to reduce the maze rate by almost 64%. And taking all these strategies together, um, new, newest generation drug eluting stents, FFR, IFR guided strategy, IVAS for optimization of PCI, um, this was uh, included in the Syntax 2 trial, a single arm study that was matched to the Syntax 1 PCI arm. And as you can see here in this kaplan Mayakov, I mean, it wasn't a randomized clinical trial, but if we can see and compare the Syntax 2 arm with the Syntax 1 PCI arm, we have a very highly significant reduction of MACE by 42%. So taking all of these studies together, we can see here if we treat our patient with a modern strategy as done as a, in the Syntax 2 trial, we have a one-year maze rate of 10.6%, what was uh, lower than the cabbage uh, maze rate in Syntax 1, and that was even lower than the um, PCI FFR arm maze rate in the FAME trial. So what is the reality? What, what can we see in clinical daily routine? And this study from the US um, New York State Registry is very nice because it clearly shows that if you do a propensity score matching in more than 18,000 18, um, patients with uh, triple vessel disease, then you can see that there is no significant difference regarding death. PCI was superior regarding stroke. That is nothing uh, we, we are really wondering about. But as shown in the other studies, there's a higher uh, myocardial infarction rate in the PCI arm. <clears throat> How can we explain this fact? If you take a look, a closer look at the effect of completeness of revascularization, then there is a clear and significant association between incomplete revascularization in PCI patients and um, the recurrence of uh, myocardial infarction during follow up <clears throat> compared to the cabbage arm. So if we completely revascularize our patients with PCI strategy, then this is the conclusion of the study, the myocardial infarction rate shouldn't be that uh, different. 
So if you take together in, in another meta-analysis these modern studies and take a look at the risk of mortality in left main patient, then there is no difference anymore between PCI and uh, cabbage. And we still have this um, significant difference regarding unplanned revascularization, what, in my opinion, isn't that issue if a patient has to undergo another intervention that is not uh, um, that uh, um, bad for the patient as compared to a stroke or uh, the decreased uh, mobility after an open heart surgery. So taken together, the heart team has to be the gatekeeper for uh, the decision-making and the strategy that is appropriate for the patient. On the one hand side, acute illness with a STEMI patient or a cardiogenic shock that clearly favors PCI strategy, while a unsuitable coronary anatomy with a high syntax score, multivessel disease, diabetes, or a distal left main might favor cabbage if the patient is stable. And um, especially we have to take into account for PCI strategies, as in my example that I'm going to show you next, is the frailty um, the patient brings uh, with him and the other comorbidities. And we have to keep in mind that, as I said in the beginning of my lecture, that only low risk patients have been included into all these um, randomized controlled trials um, uh, with a logistic Euroscore of about two to four, that is quite low, as we all know. So that has to be kept in mind. Our patient here um, that I've shown to you in the beginning has a logistic Euroscore of 14, so it's clearly a high-risk patient. And if you take a look at the Syntax 2 score, then the treatment recommendation, even from this score, even though it is quite a complex coronary anatomy, is that we should go for PCI. And I would like to show you um, in this example, intravascular imaging for strategic planning and sizing of the stents to show how a modern PCI strategy can work. First of all, we use um, IVAS for a step one evaluation of the lesion significance. And if the minimum lumen area is above six millimeters square in a disease left main, then this patient is safe for deferral. We don't have to treat this lesion. Um, if it is below, then we should go for PCI. We can characterize our lesion. We can see CVAC calcifications, differentiate that uh, anatomy from thrombus dissection or neo-intima proliferation, stand under expansion, and these things. Then in step three, we can evaluate the vessel diameter and lesion length, um, especially the distal reference diameters here, um, quite important, as we can do a pot to um, optimize the proximal part of the stent. And finally, step four, the assessment of implantation quality. And we can see in the IVOS if there is strand mal strut malapposition, stent under expansion, or edge dissection. So if we evaluate the distal left main of our patient, then we can clearly see that there is um, a Medina 111 situation. As you can see here from the diameters, the osteal LID has a minimum lumen area below four millimeters square. The distal left main is below six millimeters square and the osteal uh, circumflex artery is even below two millimeters square. So there's no doubt I would say that this is a um, significant Medina 111 uh, lesion in the left main. And if we further try to characterize our lesions in a step two evaluation with IVUS, then we can see here, uh, um, LID stand in the mid LID implanted uh, several years ago with a very nice result, um, optimally expanded. But if we go here more into the proximal part of the LID, then we can see this napkin like uh, severe calcification and circular calcification. And um, this clearly will pose a um, challenge for lesion preparation in this patient. So I don't want to go too much into detail due to reasons of time, but what we have to ask ourselves in a patient like this is if we should go for one stand or two stand strategy. As you all know, the risk of a one stand provisional stenting strategy can be that you can lose the side branch, what would be a, um, a catastrophe if you lose the circumflex artery. But on the other hand side, a suboptimal result in a two stand strategy will increase the risk for stent thrombosis and during follow up also for re -stenosis. So what we have to keep in mind from many studies that have been published uh, during the last years, and I just want to highlight the DK Crush 5 studies from uh, China published four years ago in Jack, that if we have a complex lesion, as you can see here on the right, um, 
very similar to our patient here, then a two-stand strategy, um, basically and predominantly decay crush or culotte stenting, uh, will lead to a benefit for the patient during follow-up, especially due to the fact that this will reduce uh, the need for repeat revascularization. And as you can see here, um, the distribution of instant restenosis in a two-stand strategy uh, um, arm was if we go for provisional stenting here in part of the ostium of the side branch, the um, instant restenosis rate was quite higher than compared to a decay crust strategy where we had only 5% compared to 12% restenosis rate. So here's the final result of our patient. And um, as you can see here with a decay crush stent strategy after uh, kissing balloons and pot, this looks very nicely and also has been assessed by Ivers at the end of the day so that this patient will um, benefit from um, the interventional result. So dear colleagues um, in Vietnam and Germany, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize my talk and the take home message I would like to give to you for left main disease is the following, that a PCI with new generation drug diluting stents um, will lead to a similar outcome as cabbage in terms of mortality throughout five years. We have, I would say, enough data for uh, that conclusion. And you have to keep in mind that uh, obviously PCI is associated with less periprocedural morbidity, less stroke, less periprocedural MI, acute kidney injury, and also major bleeding. But cabbage is more sustainable at the, end, uh, the um, other end side. It's associated with a better protection from recurrent ischemic events after periprocedural period. There are um, less spontaneous myocardial infarction and there's less need for repeat revascularization, but, um, and that is very important for the decision-making and also um, for the decision of the heart team. There are several um, factors that have to be kept in mind. Volume outcome relationship, um, the more uh, left main PCI the center does, the better the result will be. Intravascular imaging and the appropriate technique um, will lead uh, um, to optimal result and play an important role for left main PCI and clinical daily routine. And my take home for triple vessel coronary artery disease is that evidence is growing that mortality for cabbage and PCI with second generation DES might be similar and that there will not be a mortality difference in the future. And that therefore the decision about cabbage or PCI and three vessel disease patients should be based on the ability to completely revascularize the patients on comorbidities, how frail the patient is and if, it's, if the patient um, presents with acute or stable disease. Um, the operators should weigh the short-term risk of death and stroke with cabbage um, with a long-term benefit of reducing the risk of repeat vascularization and myocardial infarction. On the other hand side, the result might be more sustainable, especially in patients where, we'll, where you would lead a lot of stents. But that's something we can maybe also discuss. Patient's preference is also very important for the decision-making. If the patient refuses to undergo open-heart surgery, then I would say, and I would clearly say, we should offer the patient a, a interventional um, strategy after um, patient-informed uh, um, consulting. And um, probably one study that will elucidate the situation a little bit better in the future will be the FAME 3 trial, where an FFR-guided PCI strategy will be compared with an angiography-guided cabbage strategy. And this study will include um, 1,500 patients. So um, we can be excited about the results that will come in the next years. And at the end of the talk, I would like to thank for your kind invitation to this very interesting virtual conference. And um, I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zing, for this excellent presentation. And uh, we have uh, five minutes for a discussion. So we'll open the discussion now. Okay, I have a question. Uh, in uh, your hospital, you use uh, the machine or DSA or CTA to evaluate the FFR. Normally you uh, measure FFR on uh, ESA or uh, GetLab. Mm, yeah, that's, um, that's a very important um, question and a, a very good point that you made. 
Um, in our hospital, we basically use uh, FFR, an invasive strategy for FFR and IFR. I think we are not quite there uh, already that we can use CT angiography for FFR measurements. That might be the future. Um, but probably I would say all of our patients that undergo heart catheterization and therefore an invasive strategy had a positive ischemia testing or on the other hand side, um, that's something we, we do uh, doing very liberally in our hospital. They underwent a CT angiography um, before they undergo catheterization. And if there's a very high calcium load with a very high pretest probability for um, coronary artery disease, or there are even stenosis in the coronary angiography, uh, um, then um, these are typical patients. But um, to come back to your question, Basically, and I would say in almost 100% of our case, we, have, we only have an invasive strategy for FFR and IFR. And all the hands for FFR on the CE, very expensive. I know the same in uh, USA. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I mean, um, we have to talk in these days a lot about resources and um, therefore our um, I would say main approach is that the patient undergoes ischemia testing before he underwent heart catheterization. And um, I'm also glad <coughs> to have Dr. Bao de Kock uh, in my hospital, who was a very excellent um, echocardiographer. And most of the patients, they have a very good stress echo. So if we can see their hypokinesia um, under exertion, then we can skip FFR, IFR, and directly go for the PCI. But at the end of the day, I mean, um, that is quite privileged. Most of these procedures are reimbursed um, by the health insurance uh, companies right now in Germany. So um, this might change in the future. We, we don't know. There's always a discussion going on and uh, the material and the catheters and the wires, the pressure wires are quite expensive. But um, in these days, we can use it liberally. But um, just to give you an overview, only 12% in Germany um, of the patients undergoing PCI uh, got an FFR measurement or IFR measurement before PCI. So that is, I would say, a suboptimal result regarding the resources. And for our hospital, the rate is quite higher. It's something about 25 to 30%. Yeah, okay, the last question. Uh, have you used uh, CMR to evaluate the viability before uh, standing? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, especially, uh, we're doing a lot of complex PCI and CTO patients with chronic uh, total occlusions. And in these patients, if there is doubt about uh, viability in uh, um, hypokinetic myocardial area, areas, then these are typical patients to undergo CMR before they um, undergo these very complex procedures. So um, that's also a privilege in our hospital that we have a CMR um, uh, possibility available and um, the head of the department of radiology is a very good friend of mine so there's a very good collaboration in, in the clinical daily routine thank you okay thank you very much professor uh, zinning and uh, dr Hang for this uh, great discussion and then to be in time it's a great, a great pleasure for me to introduce professor thomas budde and uh, he's the chief and head of cardiology department in the Alfred Krupp Krankenhaus in Essen. And his uh, presentation is about pulmonary embolism, update 2021. Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, colleagues and friends in Vietnam, it's always nice to be with you. We agreed that the presentation will be sent as a recording. I already took this week. So... I ask the technicians to play that in now. <clears throat> they don't? Is there anybody from the technic department? Okay, then I then I have to share to share my presentation and take it uh, live now.
They told me that the presentation would be recorded on last Wednesday and they will send it now. Dear Chairman, colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you today and to talk about pulmonary embolism and uh, what is to be done in diagnostics and in therapy. It's very easy to recognize if we have a pulmonary embolism CT, but before we are often not so sure. This was a 73 year old patient and he had just a syncope and a little nausea and afterwards it turned out to be pulmonary embolism. This, however, is a very old case. 30 years ago, I did that. And this was very massive. You see the black lung here, and you see the completely occluded uh, pulmonary artery, and you can also see it in the x-ray. This is not so difficult to think of the diagnosis, but we have some problems with the not so open cases. What to say about epidemiology? The annual incidence in this country is here is going up, but on the other side, and that is lucky and makes us happy that the hospital lethality is going down. That means we have some more care and some good therapies and diagnostics. A problem is that pulmonary embolism is like a chameleon. It can change color and symptoms and signs, and it's very often undiscovered, as our German cardiac uh, newspaper shows here. We know some strong risk factors, and I'm sure you all know them, but there are some which have been added, which we did not know so long before. And this is uh, hospitalization for heart failure and for atrial fibrillation and flutter. Within the last uh, months may, however, be only this outstanding a high risk factor of myocardial infarction also. And we have to take care of these risk factors. With regard to symptoms, the problem is that the clinical signs are not always as indicative as we would like it. This is a story about, about 2,000 people which had confirmed, sorry, which had confirmed pulmonary embolism, and this is non-confirmed. And all of them, this uh, total group was suspected to have pulmonary embolism. And what you see is there is no difference in dyspnea. There is no difference that is significant with chest pain, there is no difference with cuff. So we have some problems. We always say normally the symptoms are the most important things. And we have to recognize that it's not like this in pulmonary embolism. It can be very misleading. What I also find interesting is that we have some new information or relatively new at least, that many of these patients come with syncope as first symptom. You can read here, in one out of six patients who come to the emergency room with pulmonary embolism, they have the only sign of syncope in the beginning. And I think that is very interesting and we have to take care of. The low probability or not so high probability, we have also to use scoring systems. If we don't have complete indicative signs or symptoms, we need scorings. And the world score is very well suited to go to in, into, into that, you know these symptoms here, clinical signs of deep venous thrombosis and so on, immobilization, and then you get the scoring and in, at least in our hospitals here, we use the scoring systems if we have a not clearly uh, detected pulmonary embolism or suspicion of that. The next is to go into the risk calculation. If we think or know and say yes, this may be pulmonary embolism. We have to orientate what is most risk for the patient and who is not in so high risk. And the highest risk you can ever have is hemodynamic instability and some parameters I will explain to you in a moment, right ventricular dysfunction and troponin elevated. Intermediate is then, that means the patient is hemodynamically stable and has all the other symptoms that uh, 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 summarized in the score, and here only one of them positive. And of course, if you don't have all of that, you are normally in low risk. This severity index is a little bit more specifying. 
It's called SPEZI score. It's H, high H, history of cancer, cardiopulmonary disease, and tachycardia, high blood pressure, and low blood oxygen saturation. If this is present, this is higher risk, of course. Well, should we go into diagnosis for pulmonary embolism? These green fields, we summarize very high recommendation, first class recommendation. If there is hemodynamic instability, then the next way will be to do a CT or a bedside echocardiogram. And it's also of crucial importance, very early to start with anticoagulation, because this had been shown to be the very decisive parameter for survival. So anticoagulation is the first, and the risk to do it and it's not necessary is lower, and the risk not to do it and it's pulmonary embolism. Then uh, the cr criteria, you saw the scores just before, and here once again, anticoagulation. And then um, we have to go on in our diagnostic strategy. And once again, we see here a prediction rule that is, uh, like you saw, the well score. The D dimers, they are very often thought to be very and completely exclusive, 100%. If they are negative, that is not the case. It's 95% of negative prediction and or 98%, and you should keep that in mind. The scintigraphy is, uh, of course, very valid, but it's not present in normal hospital everyday life. And so it's not so important in clinical use, I think. Very important is if you don't have CT angiography, especially to do uh, the uh, ultrasound of the lower limb to see for thrombosis. MR has no place in the diagnostics of pulmonary embolism. So what to do? Please follow the red dots I brought in this graphic. If you have a diagnostic algorithm for high risk, you know, the first question is, you found this patient is hemodynamically unstable. This is the first question, stable or unstable? And then the next question is, do I have a CT immediately or don't? If no, then you have to treat like high risk. And if yes, you should do it and you get a clear cut image. You saw that in my first patient examples at the beginning. If the patient is more stable, that means without hemodynamic instability, then you can first do, if you have a high clinical probability, it's again CT. So you see stable or unstable CT, or you don't have a CT. If you don't, then the dimers, it's especially if you have low or intermediate probability from the clinical point of view, is the best thing to do. Afterwards, what do we do? Uh, how go, go we go on? The first is anticoagulation. I already told you the decisive uh, moment and aspect, whether the patient will survive or not, is uh, do you early do you do early anticoagulation? And this is the most important. And then if you have high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk, you have different ways to go on. If you have high risk, it's reperfusion treatment, maybe with hemodynamic support. We have ECMO cases, a number rising now for treatment of pulmonary embolism. If it's intermediate, then you could do another troponin test. Of, in any case, this means hospitalization. And if it's low risk, it's a patient for early discharge. And if there are no other reasons, maybe you could make a choice to discharge relatively early. How is the reperfusion therapy? The thrombolytic therapy when hemodynamic problems appear is number one indication and you should do that. And you should also do the anticoagulation without any delay. Also already during the workup progress. And if you do that, you should start with low molecular uh, heparin or fundaparinox, and this is for most patients. And um, the patient who is uh, suitable for no X, you should start very early. And if you have patients with vitamin K dependent anticoagulation, the range to be chosen is 2.5 at best. The recommendation for doing afterwards, the anticoagulation is for more than three months, recommended in all patients with pulmonary embolism. And the discontinuation is in those patients who have very high risk factors for bleeding, but normally it's longer. And to extend it is if there are patients with additional risk factors, you can see here. 
Uh, Follow-up is very important. There have to be concepts. The treatment does not end with dismission from hospital, but this is a long treatment and follow-up, and you have to establish algorithms in your hospital to take care of that. Um, one exception for the NOAX, they are completely not recommended during pregnancy. This is very important. What are the controversies and what is the future? My last two slides. Um, first of all, we have to face a very high rate of relapsed venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism after the discontinuation of the anticoagulation. You see here, recurrence of deep venous thrombosis, 36% and recurrent pulmonary embolism, 11%. So we will have to take care of the underlying mechanism. This is very important. Was there a sufficient uh, explanation of what happened or not? Is cancer in one of the diseases of the patient? Because that is very important for follow-up. And the questions for the future, um, how can we optimize the using of the DDIMERS and the testing algorithms in certain subgroups of patients previous history of pulmonary embolism, pregnant women. And the next is, what do we do with those patients who have pulmonary embolism sub-segmental, that means very peripheral, and how can we uh, exactly estimate the long-term risk and the long-term treatment options? This is a very short presentation, I hope interesting for you about pulmonary embolism, and this is the German word for thank you. It was my pleasure to be with you and give this lecture. I am ready to answer your questions in the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Budde, for this excellent presentation. And I see that uh, Professor Ming has a question to you. Um, uh, following uh, your uh, Presentation. I, I think uh, there is uh, many uh, uh, new information. I would like to uh, know how, um, how about the roles of uh, um, no Bo Sang Tang. This is a, 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 a new one uh, normally associated with the PE5 uh, post um, um, blending to an uh, inhibitor to uh, reduce uh, the, uh, the pulmonary, uh, emboli, uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, for prevention of uh, pulmonary embolism. How can we use uh, this uh, uh, trust for prevention? I think that is a useful concept and it's uh, on the long run, it's, it's not so pronounced in the guidelines up to now, but I think it is a very good concept, yes. Yeah. Dr. Lai, Dr. Yes, I have a, a question for Professor Thomas Buddy. Uh, yeah. for, pa for patients after an, uh, pulmonary embolism, but uh, there is still the deep venous thrombosis. So, how long the anticoagulation should be continued? And uh, how about the role of NOAC? Yeah, first of all, it's, it's very important how extended this thrombosis is and whether there is a good development. If there is regression, then it would be useful to continue and to follow up again with ultrasound. Normally, I would say six months, but it depends also whether there has been uh, venous thrombosis in the, in the past before or it's a relapse of uh, thromboembolism, uh, pulmonary embolism. But if the thrombosis is going backwards and you see it's, it's fine, then maybe you can uh, do that at a uh, time longer because it may disappear completely. And you have to watch it and you have to have the compression socks and so on. So it's in a way it's an individual decision, but those people who still have thrombosis, I would say at least six months. If it's relapsed, it's longer. And how about the role of the uh, intracubal uh, venous uh, umbrella? to prevent the pulmonary embolism. Yeah, that is very interesting. I, I don't know, maybe you see it. If I hold it up, this, what you see here, is such an umbrella. Yes. You see that? 
Yes. Yes. This was in a pregnant woman some 30 years ago. I implanted that. And um, it was the only way because there were some bleeding problems also. And um, then I took it off, off afterwards. And the woman, there were siblings, they came to the world and everything was fine. And this was her present. She, she said, keep it. It's, you can use it. It's not so very often, but in special situations, you can uh, do that. But you have to think of it. If you put it in, it will do what it is designed for. It will collect thrombus. And you have to be clear what is the strategy to take it out and to take out the thrombus it collected. Um, surgery is possible, but not so nice, especially in this situation. Um, there are other techniques now, or there's local lysis. It's not so frequently, and it's in the guidelines, but it's not the first line. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, I have a question. Hi, uh, Professor Burrow. Uh, in Germany, you have uh, the patient COVID-19 with the PE and the treatment different with uh, any other uh, diseases? Please. Yeah. Um, first of all, the treatment of pulmonary embolism, it's, it's quite the same because we don't have any differential strategies first. But on the other hand, you have to keep in mind all the other manifestations of COVID-19. In our city here, the university hospital at the time, they had 150 COVID patients at ICUs in one hospital here. So big experience. And there are, uh, there are some pulmonary embolisms, but they are treated like without COVID because we don't have any experience whether there is a special therapy. My next door neighbor, he, has, he is 50 years old and he is always asking whether he can help me in the garden and so on. And he got vaccination and he got okay. afterwards, he got pulmonary embolism. It's, it's a phenomenon that is existent, yeah. Yeah, in Germany, maybe now the people has a vaccination uh, total? Not total. In our city, which is Essen, we have some 500,000 people, and the rate of people who have vaccinations, both vaccinations, mm -hmm. and uh, at least uh, six weeks after it is uh, about 55% at the moment. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much. In, Viet uh, in Vietnam, I have a question. In Vietnam, uh, some, uh, some uh, information uh, out, um, outside the hospital said that uh, we can use some uh, new uh, anticoagulant, no ox, uh, for prevention of the uh, uh, PE in case of uh, COVID-19 complication. Is this dry or no? Can we use? No um, ox? I think there are no prospective trials yet. But this is what we would do if, if there would be pulmonary embolism or deep thrombosis. Uh, this is the only we have at the moment. There is no clear concept that is differentiated uh, to the factor that is COVID and pulmonary embolism. In Germany, we have about three to four groups with high numbers of COVID patients and post-COVID patients, post-COVID patients, 250 and so on. Uh, we are just gaining experience. It's the same with uh, atrial fibrillation. It's interesting uh, that 10, up to 10% of the people with COVID have risen disturbances afterwards. But it's at the moment, there is no prospective trial. It's just uh, cases. But I would guess it's useful to do it. You, 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 this is the only thing you have in your hands. Uh, we have a, a question from the audience. Audience, uh, in which patients should we use uh, the thrombosis analysis uh, therapy? Thrombosis from the audience. Uh, thrombolysis, thrombolysis, yeah. Um, thrombolysis is suited especially for patients. You, you saw the first uh, branch of the decision tree. Is the patient stable or is he unstable? And if it's unstable, then it's reperfusion. If you have any technique to do reperfusion just uh, with anticoagulation, let's say suction or anything, or thrombus fragmentation, and everything is fine, then you can stay with anticoagulation. But if the patient is unstable and you don't have any other means, it's immediately, there is a class one. These were the green lights in my slides. Uh, it's a patient for thrombolysis very soon.
And if you are in a situation where he's first stable and he is deteriorating and is getting worse and then unstable, this is rescue thrombolysis and it's a very clear cut indication also. Okay, are there any more questions? So thank you very much, Professor Buddha, for thank the so very much. important disease of pulmonary embolism. And in all of time, we, uh, we want to go forward. Uh, but I, uh, unfortunately, I, I want to apologize. Dr. Fisk, unfortunately, cannot participate today for private reasons. And so I want to lead uh, now to the next presentation of Dr. Klaus Fleischmann. He has pre-recorded his presentation and uh, his talk is about uh, STEMI and acute coronary syndrome, challenging cases from the catheter. So the technicians can the, uh, play back the uh, pre-recorded presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to join the Central Vietnamese Heart Association Con Congress, and I will present you some challenging cases in the context of acute myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndrome in the hospital of Wolfsburg, Germany. So my first case is a 56-year-old man. He's working in the Volkswagen factory, which is just 15 minutes from our hospital. And he's a current smoker and has chest pain since some days. But this morning when he arrived at work at 6.50, he had very severe chest pain and he went to the emergency department of the factory and they did an ECG immediately. As you can see, the emergency call was about two minutes before seven here and the ECG was done 15 minutes later, which is quite good. And this is what the ECG showed. You see a large myocardial inferior infarction and the colleagues of the emergency department in the factory, they called us in the hospital. They give us, gave us a phone call to tell us here is a man 56 years old with a large infarction. And so we could prepare in the cath lab for this patient to arrive. And when he arrived in the cath lab, we found a right coronary artery occluded as you see here in the proximal part. It's a quite big artery and uh, left is none, severely deceased, and we put a wire through and then we found a large thrombus here. So you see the white material here. So we decided to proceed for thrombus aspiration, which we did here, and we got some red clot out of this artery. And uh, as you know, it's not a standard in the guidelines to do thrombus aspiration. It's even say Guidelines say routine use is not recommended, but it says a routine. In selected cases, there's even an advantage in mortality. So in cases of large residual thrombus burden, you can do that. And this is what we had when we placed a stand and we were very content with this result. And we had only a small inferior hypokinesia in this patient which had been treated, as you can see, about one hour and 20 minutes after onset of symptoms. So to achieve one hour and 20 minutes, you have to do not only a good procedure, but you have to do good logistics. So we had uh, the phone call from the factory emergency department to our emergency department, and we had the patient uh, directly transferred to the cath lab from the ambulance car to the cath lab. No stop at the emergency department, no stop at the in intensive care unit. And this is crucial. So if we can uh, achieve only one hour and a little bit from onset of symptoms, we can preserve uh, the left ventricular function most optimally. My second case shows a 69 year old man and he had chest pain in the night, maybe four o'clock in the early morning, but he did not call the ambulance. So he went to his family doctor and when he arrived there it was 10 and when the ECG was done, it was almost 11. And the ECG showed inferior myocardial infarction also. And this patient was brought by ambulance uh, to our 
health lab, and we found uh, tachycardia right bundle branch block. And in bundle branch block, it's sometimes difficult to recognize this T segment elevation, but here you can see in two, three, and we F, we have large inferior infarction. And the symptoms are about six hours old now. And this patient is in beginning cardiogenic shock. As you can see, the arterial pressure is low and he's tachycardic. And what we find is right coronary artery not severely diseased, surprisingly, because the ECG suggested right coronary problem. And then we found left circumflex occluded here. But as I told you, some hours already is occluded and we find additional high-grade stenosis in the LAD directly after the left main. So what should we do? Should we do the LAD or should we do the circumflex artery? We decided to wire both vessels, which was uh, moderately difficult. And after wiring, we have flow here in the circumflex artery. And then we put a stent here and we were quite confident with the result. And uh, we had here some side branch problem, which we didn't address. And then we had to decide whether we should do or not the high proximal LAD. And we decided to do that. And we put a stand just adjacent to the left main and uh, inflated the stand. And we got a quite good result, as you can see here. So uh, we did uh, non infarct related artery in the context of acute coronary syndrome with cardiogenic shock. You see we have good results here in different projections and uh, we have a rather severely depressed left ventricular function not only in the inferior bar part as you see here and in the lateral wall as you see here but also in the anterior wall. So I think we were right to do the left anterior descendant artery uh, uh, with the infarct related artery, uh, especially because the uh, hemodynamic situation was bad. So this patient had a large CK rise and he had persistent uh, left ventricular impairment after five days due to the fact he arrived only six hours after uh, the in the onset of symptoms. So guidelines say maybe we should consider this, uh, but we should not do it routinely as it's stated here, but we have to uh, choose as in the Schrumpus aspiration selected cases where it be, can be done with a little risk and a good uh, procedural result. So next patient, he was 76 years old and he came to our hospital with uh, chest pain since uh, several days. He has chronic coronary disease with a stent in the right coronary artery 20 years ag uh, ago. And he had end stemy troponin elevated and ST segment depression, not ST segment elevation. And surprisingly, left ventricular function is quite good. And uh, right coronary artery with the old stent also is good. So we have the impression this patient has no severe coronary stenosis, but we have to look closely and we find a high grade left uh, circumflex osteal lesion. So we did, uh, and if you look closer, we find left main is also um, not, uh, not sane. So we have to do bifurcation intervention in this case and we wire both vessels and we did uh, pre-dilatation to the circumflex. And then we did a stent implantation with a balloon in the, in the left LID and the stent in the circumflex with simultaneous balloon inflation. And we got a rather good result. In this case, we preserved left main, we preserved LID and we got the circumflex open. So this is a quite challenging case which I show you here, and we got a good result. And in another patient, 60 years old, we have severe ischemia with ST segment elevation in VR and ST segment 
Here could you see we are and this T segment depression in nearly every other lead, which has chest, left main disease, or three, three vessel disease. And this patient he has a cardiac ending shock also, and uh, his uh, angiogram shows right coronary artery stenosis and collaterals to the left, as you can see here. And this patient has severe left main disease with a large burden of a third atherosclerotic material. So in this case, we decided not, he has another lesion here in the circumflex also. So we decided not to go for intervention, left vein, left ventricular function is preserved, a lot of calcification here in the area of left main. And we decided to send him to cabbage where he was operated in the same afternoon, about three hours later with a very good result. So we must know, we cannot do every patient in the cath lab, we should be prudent and courageous at the same time. And so we can good results for our patients. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Fleischmann. Unfortunately, he's not here to discuss uh, his uh, uh, presentation so that I want to move to the next presentation of Dr. Birgit Gericke. She's from the University Heart Center in Göttingen and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce her for her presentation about pharmacological heart failure therapy, an update in 2021. Dear Birgit, we're excited to hear your talk. Okay, but I have a problem. I cannot uh, share my screen. There's someone who is preventing this. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you first for inviting me to this Congress. Um, I think um, it's a hard work to do this now for the actual ESC guidelines are only valid till the end of this uh, month in August 2021, there will be the new ESC guidelines. So I think my task is to make you curious for the new guidelines and to show you something that you can look up in the new guidelines when they are arrived. These are the old guidelines. This is a central figure for the patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And you see here the stepwise approach with first the ACE inhibitors and the beta blocker. Then when the patient is still symptomatic, the MR antagonist, then also still symptomatic uh, change to the uh, ARNI and look for other um, therapies. So um, we will see what will be ch changed uh, in the next guidelines. Uh, this is new a position paper of the um, heart failure societies of the Canadian, the Indian, um, the American, the Japanese and of the heart failure association of the European society. They uh, tell us here about the signs and symptoms of the laboratory tests and the objective evidence for uh, cardiogenic pulmonary or systematic congestion. That is not new, but um, as we had a new uh, form of heart failure in the last guidelines, we now have a fourth class of patients. You see here the HEF-REF and you see the HEF-PEF patients. And as it was introduced in 2016, there is another class between these with the ejection fraction between 41 and 49. At that time, it was called the mid-range ejection fraction. Now they call it the mildly reduced ejection fraction. But this is new. This is the heart failure with improved ejection fraction. And I think that is a good classification wall for we have patients that had initially severely reduced ejection fraction and after therapy, they have a better ejection fraction and they say it must be better than 40%, better more than 10 points 
um, increase from the baseline eject infection. So I think we have now four classes to discuss with our patients and perhaps with our therapies. Heart failure is a malign disease. It has a, a survival rate of about 50% after five years and uh, one third of the patients will live after 10 years. That is a poor survival, poorer than um, many cancer diseases. And I think this is also our task to look for the patients. For if you look at this um, paper from Pecker and Metra, they showed that only less than 1% of the patients have all the guideline directed medical therapy and um, this therapy in the right dosage. And this has um, also so shown in the CHAMP registry. And you can see here that about one quarter of the patients will not get an ACE inhibitor um, or an ARNI having no contraindications, but they are not treated. And this is a quarter of the patients. And for the beta blocker, it's a third of the patients. And for the MR antagonists, it's uh, about two thirds of the patients. That are very high numbers, and that's not good for the patients. For um, It can be shown from meta-analysis of the heart failure studies that more drugs will have a better outcome in survival. Mortality will decrease with the substances given compared to placebo. And this is not only a number, that this means a time, lifetime for the patients. You see here uh, the numbers from the emphasis heart failure trial with the patients with ACE inhibitors, uh, RB or beta blockers compared to those with additional MR antagonists. And you see here that there is a difference. And for a 55-year-old man, this is about eight years, six to 10 years, eight years longer life for these patients. And I think we have to work for our, for our patients. And it's not only giving the drugs, it's also starting the drugs. For uh, when you look at the data of the Pioneer HF trial, you can see here, this is the ARNI, and this is the ACE inhibitors, that even at the time of one month, there is a significant um, difference between the groups. So starting early is better for the patients. You can see it here with the changes in the NT pro BNP levels. At one week, there is a significant change. And these differences with the clinical benefit in the first years, weeks of the treatment, you can also see for the uh, uh, empagliflucin and for the dapagliflucin. Uh, so it's urgent for the patient to start early with the therapy. And we have to think of those who will benefit most from our treatment. You can see here from the data of the dapagliflucin trial, those patients with prior heart failure hospitalizations. If you have never had a heart failure hospitalization, there is a difference between the groups, between the dapagliflucin and the placebo group. But for those who had a heart failure hospitalization less than 12 months ago, the difference is much higher, so they will profit more from this therapy. But we don't know how to do this. You see here the a scheme for the guidelines from 2008. Uh, all the substances were given uh, after one after another. Then in the 2012, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers were given together. And we don't know what we will uh, hear in 2021. Will they all give together? And uh, how shall we do that? We don't know. Uh, but we will see in um, end of August at the Congress. Uh, I think when we talk about the ARNIs, uh, they and the upcoming guidelines will probably 
allowed to be given uh, not in the follow-up, but early in some patient groups. I look forward to what they define for these patient groups. And if you have to switch from ACE inhibitor to ARNI, I want to remember you that you have to have a pause of at least uh, 36 hours. Let's have a look at the new class of the sodium-dependent glucose transporter 2 inhibitors. They work at the kidney in the tubuli and they um, reduce the glucose reabsorption and with this the patient will use glucose, sodium and water and this will help him. And this could be shown in two great uh, trials, the Emperor reduced trial and the DARPA HF trial. All these patients had uh, ejection fractions below 40% and it was allowed to have a depressed renal function but with a GFR of above 20 for the uh, empagliflucine and above 30 for the dapagliflucine. Um, and the patients um, had a positive effect from this. They had less hospitalizations and there were fewer deaths. And that's very important, the dapagliflucine was as effective in the patients without type 2 diabetes as it was in those with type 2 diabetes. The emperor reduced trial also showed um, a positive effect for deaths and recurrent hospitalizations for uh, the substances and the patients treated with empagliflucine. What have we looked for the sodium glucose uh, transporter? We have to see that they will have a volume depletion and so in all patients you start with the therapy, you have to adjust the diuretic therapy. You have to know that there may be a diabetic acidosis and there is glucose in the urine. So um, in the studies, they had more urogenital infections in these patients. We are waiting for the ESC guidelines, but I looked up for you for the other guidelines, the Canadian heart failure um, guideline was just published in the spring this year and they start with an initial therapy of ARNI or ACE inhibitor, then beta blocker, then the MR antagonist and the SGLT2 inhibitor, same as uh, all as a standard therapy for these patients with an ejection fraction below 40%. And they put all the other uh, therapies around that. And then I looked for the uh, ACC expert consensus in heart failure. Uh, and they have, for those patients with a heart uh, failure with reduced ejection fraction, the ARNI and the beta blockers and the diuretics. And they um, add the other substances around this. So uh, they differ and we are waiting for what DSC will tell us. The ACC has um, uh, all these substances um, um, near to each other with all the uh, contraindications and indications and dosages you have to recommend. It, I think it's very nice to read this. But there are also two new um, medications one is the very Siguat, that is a stimulator of the soluble granulat cyclase, and the other is the myosin activator omega tif mica um, The very Siguat was published in May 2020. It's the Victoria trial, and this Victoria trial could not uh, give us um, a better outcome for death, but there were fewer rehospitalizations for heart failure in the Verusiguat group. So um, the data is not so that we have to uh, use this in the first line, but it's for those who have uh, repeated hospitalizations. The omicaptiv myosin activator, uh, this medication makes that the myosin heads 
will work better in the patients. You see here, before the drug, there are less of the myosin heads that are working compared to with the droop. So the galactic trial showed us, it was uh, published in January this year, and it also has no significant data for death, uh, but uh, some data for the hospitalization uh, heart failure events. Um, I found the ACC expert uh, consensus guidelines very um, good for the comorbidity management for they told all the comorbidities and all uh, um, heart failure patients have up to 10 comorbidities. And you can see here that this may be cardiovascular, this may be systemic, this may be general conditions, and they show well the guidelines are for these comorbidities. And uh, I want to um, stress on one comorbidity for um, the Tafamidis was published in uh, 2080 in the Atarapt Act trial for patients with transturetic amyloid cardiomyopathy. And it showed that the mortality of these patients could be reduced with the Tafamidis survival was much better in those patients after about two and a half years. And it was not only the death, but also the rehospitalizations but we have to look that uh, the therapy, it's a very expensive therapy, has to be initiated early for the survival was better and the hospitalization rates were lower in those with New York Heart Association classes one and two compared to those with um, class three. So um, we have to think about these um, disease and it will be stressed in the guidelines. Uh, I told you that we don't know how DSC will um, uh, put it in a figure, but Professor Bauer Sachs from uh, Hanover uh, Medical School made this um, figure in his paper and he called it the Fantastic Four. And um, this means that uh, you have these four drugs, the beta blocker and the ARNI, the SGLT2 in beta and the MR antagonists. And you have to put all your other uh, therapeutic things around that, meaning uh, looking for the rhythm, looking for even things like uh, left ventricular assist devices or heart transplantation or valvular uh, therapies like mitral edge to edge repair. So I think we are waiting for how they will do it. But I want to show you that heart failure therapy is not only taking the diagnosis and prescribing or titrate uh, a medication, but it's also patient education, lifestyle prescription, and psychological and social support, and of life counseling and care, and coordinating the comorbidities. Um, there are only a few information about the new guidelines from the Heart Failure Congress uh, some weeks ago, and they told that there will be a simplified treatment algorithm for FREF patients uh, based on the four major classes, that there will be some um, recommendations for the treatment of uh, mild reduced ejection fraction, and that there will be some treatment algorithms for the phenotypes for the patients with a broader QRS complex or the ischemic versus the non-ischemic etiology for rhythm problems, for the comorbidities, diabetes, iron deficiency, hyperkalemia, for cancer patients and for amyloidosis or other cardiomyopathies. So I hope I have made you curious about the new guidelines. Um, these are the data for the Congress. It will be only online, but I hope I can see you on the ESC Congress 2022 again. 
Thank you for your attention. And now I'm ready for the discussion. I have a question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharka, for very uh, informative and latest information uh, of your presentation. I have uh, two questions about uh, the treatment for a patient with heart failure uh, with reduced EF. The first is the RD and SGLT2 has a priority than uh, diuretics in the patients with low blood pressure, I mean less than 100 millimeter. Uh, for example, he's al already in the uh, loop di diuretic and MRI. And then uh, we need to do some RB or SGRT2. Should we reduce the dose of the loop diuretic or not? And the second question is, uh, if the patient has an ischemic heart disease and a reduced EF, then how about the role of the setting in these patients? Should we keep the target LDL cholesterol or we should reduce the dose of statin? Um, okay, let me uh, try to answer the first question. I think the blood pressure is often a problem for giving the ARNI. Uh, and there are um, patients that will not tolerate the ARNI for the um, reduction in blood pressure is more than when you give um, um, candesartan or valsartan uh, drug. So um, we try it in very low doses and we uh, try to uh, elevate the dose over time. Uh, but uh, that is a problem for some patients. Uh, with the diuretics, um, you have only to give the amount of diuretic that you need to keep the patient without congestion. If all the water is out, you can um, decrease the dosage of the loop diuretics and um, most of the people also, those with the severely reduced ejection fraction uh, will need only small dosages of the torosamide, for example. So um, you have to try and to look, uh, but uh, I always tell the patients that the diuretics, the uh, torosamide is not for prolonging their life, but to keep out the water uh, of their bodies. And then uh, if we have to talk about the ischemic uh, patients, there are some data from um, former years and studies that the statins will not help for those who have um, heart failure. Heart failure himself, uh, itself cannot be addressed by the statins, but if we know that the patient has severe um, coronary heart disease with, um, with progress over time, then we try to give them the statins. But uh, when they are, um, I will not address um, a limit of 45 uh, of 55 milligrams per deciliter uh, LDL cholesterol for these with severely reduced ejection fraction. Thank you. Uh, and now I have a question here on the screen. Uh, I have no, um, I've never worked with the phenyrenone. I don't know uh, with, if this would help. And this is the um, New York Heart Association three patients. Um, I would change the spironolactone to eplonone for the eplonone uh, makes uh, less blood pressure reduction than the spironolactone. Um, I think the beta blocker, uh, I will try to have a good heart rate below 
um, 70 for these patients. And um, I would try to give this. Um, it, two weeks ago, I had a, a patient who were very small uh, and um, she, could, she had lost weight for about 10 kilos in the last month. I had to stop the SKLT2 inhibitors for she lost um, water and she lost um, the glucose with this medication. For I think we will have our guidelines, but we have to treat every patient with his um, complete uh, conditions uh, to help him. Are there any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, hi, Professor uh, Bergic Rirke. It's a long time uh, to see you. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, um, very happy uh, to see you and, uh, and, uh, and have very healthy uh, appearance. <laughs> so I, um, recently we have um, many information concerning about the uh, drug therapy in case of a high failure reducer EF and, and uh, they advise to use uh, association many uh, uh, high failure drugs for example uh, RNA, RNA and uh, SGLT2 inhibitors so in case of uh, end stage renal heart failure can we, we uh, combine R9 and SGNT2 inhibitor. Uh, you can combine these drugs? Yeah, in case of uh, anesthesia of renal failure, kidney, renal, kidney, renal failure. Um, um, you have to look whether um, there is any contraindications. If the uh, eject, if the GRF is below 30, it's hard to do the ARNI and uh, it's if it, it's um, above 20, then you may not give the SGLT2 inhibitors. So they are not allowed at that time. There are data for kidney diseased patients that the SGLT2 inhibitors will improve the renal function over time, but um, it's not allowed to give them at this time. For I think we have to wait for more data. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I saw a question from the audience. Can you put back the uh, slide? There is a slide with uh, two questions from the audience. Uh, we had this slide all okay thank you okay okay ladies and gentlemen and uh, dear uh, colleagues professors from vietnam and germany so that was a very uh, highlight uh, a, a session here at this congress and i want to thank all the presentations all the um, colleagues uh, sorry we have a vietnamese presentation we have more, oh, oh, one more. Sorry. One, one more. more, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah, here's a professor, Professor Le Quang Tu. He's uh, this next one. Oh, I'm so sorry, yeah. And uh, this, uh, I want to present him, Professor Dr. Le Quang Tu with his presentation. Okay, dear yeah, professor. Kính thưa chủ tòa đoàn, kính thưa quý thầy, quý bà đồng nghiệp. À, ngày hôm nay trong khuôn khổ của cái hội nghị uh, tim mạch uh, miền Trung và Tây Nguyên mở rộng uh, xin phép được uh, thay mặt cho khoa ngoại lông ngực tim mạch của bệnh viện Trung ương Huế uh, báo cáo về một cái chủ đề về ngoại khoa về tim mạch đó là cái đánh giá cái kết quả cái phẫu thuật uh, thay van động mạch chủ cơ học uh, tại khoa ngoại lông ngực tim mạch bệnh viện Trung ương Huế. Thì uh, chúng ta biết rằng là cái phẫu thuật thái van động mạch chủ cơ học thì nó được thực hiện ở những cái bệnh nhân có những cái bất thường về mặt trái phổ và chức năng của van động mạch chủ gây nên các cái bệnh lý đó là hẹp van hở van hoặc là hẹp van và hở van kết hợp chúng với nhau trên cùng một cái bệnh nhân thì
cái phẫu thuật mà để điều trị cái bệnh lý ván động mạch chủ này đã được thực hiện từ hơn một cái thế kỷ nay à, với rất nhiều các cái kỹ thuật khác nhau bắt đầu từ cái sơ khai đó là cái việc uh, sửa ván động mạch chủ bằng cách mở các cái commissure của các cái lá ván cho đến cái việc là hiện tại bây giờ người ta đang thực hiện đó là thay ván cơ học hoặc thay ván sinh học và tiến bộ hơn một tỷ nữa đó là hiện tại người ta đã thay ván động mạch chủ qua da và là tavi thì <cười> À, hiện nay đây vẫn được xem như là một trong những cái phương án mà tối ưu để mà điều trị cho cái bệnh lý ván động mạch chủ tại hoa kỳ thì hàng năm chúng ta có khoảng 100 trăm ngàn bệnh nhân được phẫu thuật thay ván động mạch chủ còn tại bệnh viện trung huệ chúng tôi thì à, cái phẫu thuật thay ván động mạch chủ này được thực hiện từ năm 2000 và đến nay đã đạt được những cái kết quả rất tích cực do đó chúng tôi làm cái nghiên cứu này để đánh giá cái kết quả thay ván động mạch chủ cơ học tại khoa của chúng tôi về đối tượng nghiên cứu thì chúng tôi có 235 bệnh nhân được thay ván động mạch chủ cơ học tại khoa trong vòng từ trong vòng 4 năm từ năm 2016 tới năm 2020 thì trong cái nhóm mà nghiên cứu này thì tất cả bệnh tất cả cái bệnh nhân trong cái nhóm này thì đều là những cái bệnh nhân mà có bệnh lý ván động mạch chủ đơn thuần và những cái bệnh nhân mà có bệnh lý ván động động mạch chủ kết hợp thêm với những cái bệnh lý khác ví dụ giống như bệnh lý về ván hai lá bệnh lý mạch vành hoặc là những cái bệnh mặt phẳng thì được loại ra khỏi cái nhóm nghiên cứu này về phương pháp nghiên cứu thì đây là những cái mô tả hồi cũ chúng tôi tìm lại hồ sơ của tất cả các bệnh nhân được phẫu thuật thay ván động mạch chủ À, từ năm 2016 đến năm 2020 và các cái chỉ định về cái thai văn đồng mật chủ này thì dựa trên cái tiêu chuẩn của Hội tim mạch Hoa Kỳ năm 2014 và Hội tim mạch học Việt Nam năm 2014 tất cả các cái bệnh nhân mà trước khi được tiến hành phẫu thuật thai văn đồng mật chủ thì đều phải được làm đầy đủ các cái xét nghiệm tiêm phẫu đặc biệt là phải được siêu âm tim rất là kỳ càng rất là nhiều lần trước khi mổ nhằm phát hiện ra các cái thương tổn à, à, đã có sẵn từ là trước mổ và dự phòng những cái vấn đề nó có thể xảy ra À, sau khi mổ hoặc là trong khi mổ chúng ta nói sớm qua một tí về cái cái, cái, cái kỹ thuật thái cái ván đồng mạch chủ à, <cười> qua cái đường mổ ở giữa xuống ức thì tất nhiên là trong cái phẫu thuật này thì chắc chắn là chúng ta sẽ có một cái đường mổ ở giữa xuống ức cái đường mổ này là một cái đường mổ mà rất được là ưa chuồng trong cái phẫu thuật tím hợp đây là cái đường mổ mà giúp cho chúng ta thứ nhất là đánh giá rất tốt các cái thương tổn thứ hai là sự trị tuyệt để các cái thương tổn và thứ ba là có thể kiểm soát được những cái vấn đề không mong muốn nó có thể xảy ra trong cái quá trình mà chúng ta phẫu thuật thì à, phẫu thuật này bắt đầu bằng cái việc là chúng ta phải mở cái xương ức của bệnh nhân rồi sau đó chúng ta mở mang tim đó sau đó chúng ta mở mang tim ra thì sau đó chúng ta sẽ bộc lộ được cái động mạch chủ một cái hệ thống cái phẫu thuật à, thay ván động mạch chủ đó là một cái phẫu thuật tim hợp do đó nó đòi hỏi chúng ta phải có một cái một cái thiết bị gọi là tung hoang ngoài cơ thể cái thiết bị này nó sẽ thay mặt cho cái tim và cái phổi của chúng ta để nó bơm máu đi nuôi cơ thể trong cái quá trình mà chúng ta làm ngưng cái tính và cái phổi lại để chúng ta sửa chữa hoặc là chúng ta thay thế các cái ván tim hoặc là các cái dị tật ở trong tim người chúng và ở đây là cái ván đồng mật chủ nó riêng sau đó chúng ta mở ván đồng mật chủ chúng ta mở đồng mật chủ để chúng ta cắt các cái là ván bị thương tổn sau đó chúng ta sẽ khâu lại ở đây một cái ván cơ học đây là nạn của một cái ván cơ học được sử dụng tại cái trung tâm của chúng tôi Đấy, sau khi xong thì chúng tôi sẽ cột cái van này và lại vào nơi cái vòng van và sau đó thì chúng tôi động đồng mật chủ lại chúng tôi cho tim đập lại và sau đó thì chúng tôi sẽ giảm ngưng CEC và động ngược lại cho bệnh nhân như vậy là một cái phẫu thuật thay van đồng mật chủ đã được hoàn thành ở trên cái bệnh nhân này như vậy kết quả thì trong vòng uh, như vậy gần 4 năm thì cái kết quả về tuổi thì trung bình của chúng tôi là 55,2 tuổi còn trừ 13,1 tuổi lớn nhất là 66 tuổi và nhỏ nhất là 8 tuổi cái bệnh nhân nhỏ tuổi nhất này là một cái bệnh nhân người dân tộc cái đó à, chúng tôi lựa chọn cái phẫu thuật thái ván cơ học cho cái bệnh nhân này mặc dù biết rằng là cái độ tuổi này thì nó rất khó để mà uống thuộc chống đông nhưng mà cái ván sinh học thì tuổi thọ nó thấp hơn cho đó chúng tôi vẫn ưu tiên lựa chọn cái ván cơ học cho cái bệnh nhân này về giới thì nam tới 69,5% mươi chín năm phần trăm và nữ tới ba mươi năm phần trăm cái tỷ lệ nam nữ là hai hai mươi bảy trên một về cái tiền sử thấp tim được phẫu thuật thì có tiền sự thấp là chiếm 9,62% và không có tiền sự thấp rõ ràng thì 90,38%. Cái điều này nó cho thấy rằng là cái cái cái, cái việc mà điều trị dự phòng thấp tim đã giảm đi đã rất là phát triển ở Việt Nam mình và do đó cái tỷ lệ bệnh nhân bị bán đồng mật chủ do thấp nó đã giảm đi rất là nhiều. Đây là một cái dấu hiệu rất là đáng mừng. Về tình trạng suy tim trước mộ thì không có trường hợp nào suy tim đồ 1 và 3,85 trường hợp suy tim đồ 4 rất là nặng về ít quang ngực thì cái chỉ số tim ngực chiếm trên 50% phần trăm đây là biểu hiện của những cái trường hợp mà nó suy tim rất là nặng về phân loại bệnh lý ván động mạch chủ trên siêu âm thì chúng tôi chia thành ba nhóm thì trong đó cái nhóm chiếm tỷ lệ cao nhất đó là nhóm hở hẹp ván phối hợp với nhau chiếm tỷ lệ 44,23%. phần trăm về
năm bệnh này tiền tỷ lệ một phần phần trăm những cái trường hợp này nó những cái trường hợp mà có bệnh lý văn một chủ mà cái chức năng tim nó suy giảm như vậy thì tiên lượng trong một và sau một sẽ rất là nặng về cái kích thước của thất tải của cái bún động mật chủ và cái vòng ván động mật chủ thì uh, trung bình thì uh, của bún động mật chủ là 34,94 của uh, vòng ván động mật chủ là 24,19 và của cái uh, đường kính của tâm trương của thất trải là 55,75 và tâm thu thất trải là 39,94 và uh, và như vậy thì chỉ có là trong cái nhóm là uh, vòng ván động uh, vòng ván động mật chủ rồi kích thước tâm thu thất trải và kích thước tâm trương thất trải là chỉ có ý nghĩa thống kê là có sự khác biệt có ý nghĩa thống kê về đặc điểm trong quá trình phẫu thuật thì thời gian chạy tung hoang ngoài cơ thể là 95 cộng trừ 25,16 phút thời gian cặp động mật chủ là 71,63 cộng trừ 15,51 phút trong một thì không có biến chứng và tử vong trong một cũng không có về thương tổ ván động mật chủ ghi nhận thì chủ yếu là các cái thương tổ dài sẽ là ván chiếm 80,77% à, về cái kết quả hậu phẫu thì cái thời gian năm hồi sức là 5,79 cộng trừ 2,44 ngày và thời gian Uh, hậu phẫu là 17,02 cộng từ 5,63 ngày. Cái thời gian năm hồi sức là thời gian mà tính từ lúc một ra cho, cho đến khi bệnh nhân rời khỏi ICU và thời gian hậu phẫu là thời, thời gian từ khi mổ xong cho đến lúc mà bệnh nhân ra viện. Về hoạt động bán tim thì tất cả là điều 203 trường hợp chiếm 86,54% là tốt. Hợi nhà thì chỉ chiếm 32%. Tất cả các trường hợp này đều là trong bán cả. Tức là do cái nhà sản xuất. <cười> Như vậy thì sáu mộ thì cái so sánh sáu mộ thì cái phân suất tổng màu sáu mộ trung bình là 55,29 cộng trừ 7,82% và khác biệt là không có ý nghĩa thống kê so với trước mộ trong khi đó thì cái kích thước tấm trương sáu mộ là nó giảm so với trước mộ và có ý nghĩa thống kê kích thước tấm thu thì nó cũng giảm so với trước mộ và có ý nghĩa thống kê điều này chứng tỏ là cái phẫu thuật này nó đem lại cái lợi ích là rất là lớn cho bệnh nhân sau khi mổ xong về chính áp có ván động mật chủ thì chính áp là trung bình là 24,37 cộng trừ 9,30 mm thủy ngân và các việc chiếm bá nhóm bệnh lý ván động mật chủ là không có ý nghĩa thống kê về biến chứng trong giai đoạn hậu phẫu thì trong giai đoạn hậu phẫu chúng tôi gặp chủ yếu là các cái biến chứng mà thường gặp nhất đó là chảy máu trang dịch mang phổi và trang dịch mang tim tổng tỷ lệ của cả ba cái này là chiếm tỷ lệ 19,24% chín hai mươi bốn phần trăm cái biến và hẹp ván động mật chủ kết hợp với nhau thì nó chiếm đá số thì hiện nay tại trung tâm của chúng tôi thì cái phẫu thuật thay ván động mật chủ cơ học đã trở thành nó thường quy à, có tỷ lệ thành công rất là cao tỷ lệ tái biến biến chứng thì rất là thấp à, đây là một trong những cái phương pháp mà nó an toàn hiệu quả cho những cái trường hợp bệnh nhân mắc cái bệnh lý ván động mật chủ trong cái điều kiện của việt nam chúng ta hiện nay mặc dù thì hiện nay à, đã có những cái phương pháp nó tiện bộ hơn trong cái việc thay ván động mật chủ à, nó giúp cho ít can thiệp đến bệnh nhân hơn nhưng mà những cái phương pháp đó thì hiện nay ở Việt Nam chúng ta là vẫn chưa được áp dụng một cách rộng rãi do cái nhiều yếu tố khách quan khác nhau. À, vừa rồi là cái bài báo cáo của tôi. Xin chân thân cảm ơn ạ. Thank you very much, Professor Lê Quang Thu. Excellent presentation. Are there some questions from the audience? Some questions, some comments. Yes, I I have one question for Doctor Thục. Yeah, I'm nghe thầy. Yeah. Wow, xin chào Thục, cảm ơn. Yeah, I'm chào thầy. Yeah. Là có một cái báo cáo tổng kết trong vòng năm năm về thay van đồng mạch chủ cơ học và kết quả rất là tốt, rất là hoan nghênh. Dạ, em cảm ơn thầy ạ. Dạ. Dạ. Chúng ta cũng biết là cái cái phương pháp hiện nay đang được sử dụng thường quy vẫn là đường mổ xương ức kinh mở rộng kinh điển và thay van đồng mạch chủ cơ học cho người trẻ và do vậy cho nên là trong cái series mà anh thục vừa mới báo cáo chúng ta thấy là 
đa phần bệnh nhân của chúng ta là bệnh nhân trẻ à, tuy vậy gần đây thì nó cũng đã có những cái sự thay đổi trong cái quan điểm sử dụng van đối với uh, van cơ học thì đối với người trẻ thì là chuyện đương nhiên thế nhưng mà gần đây với cái sự xuất hiện của những cái chất liệu những cái loại van mới uh, ví dụ như loại van uh, uh, van van sinh học thì những cái van này thì cái độ bền của nó đang nghiên cứu thế nhưng mà người ta cho phép đến gần đến 20 năm rồi và yeah. vì vậy cho nên nếu như chúng ta đối với người trẻ chúng ta có thể thay van sinh học thì chúng ta yeah. phải phải dùng các thuốc chống đông rồi yeah. sau đó với sự can thiệp của tim mạch thay van trong van van trong van yeah. thì yeah. cái thời gian mà hoạt động của một cái van tim nó sẽ kéo dài vì vậy đây cũng là một cái xu thế mới thôi chứ chưa phải là đưa vào trong tay lai nhưng mà có lẽ là cũng, chúng ta cũng nên bắt đầu tiếp cận dần đó là cái thứ nhất cái thứ hai là liên quan đến cái đường mổ thì uh, hiện nay thì bên đường mổ kinh điển thì chúng ta đã làm kết quả rất là tốt rồi thế nhưng những cái sự phát triển này về mini invasive thì uh, người ta có thể mổ những cái đường uh, đối với đồng chủ thì có thể là nửa trên của xương ức hoặc yeah. là mà bên uh, uh, sát bên uh, ở bên tương dương xương ức thì có thể tiếp cận được với van động mạch chủ và sự tiếp cận được van động mạch chủ chúng ta có thể thay được với van cơ học một cách là, là cũng tương đối không phải là khó yeah. vậy, cho nên rất là tôi cũng biết là chỗ bác sĩ thuộc và cái kiếp của bác sĩ thứ cũng đang có triển khai thay van chủ bằng mini invasive Uh, nhưng mà vì số liệu ít nên chưa báo cáo hy vọng trong cái uh, năm tới có hội nghị thì sẽ báo cáo cái nhóm series này uh, xin dạ. chào, xin chúc mừng uh, kiếp của uh, trung tâm tim mạch các cơ mạch bệnh viện trung ương huế dạ em cảm thấy ạ dạ vâng dạ um, alo uh, kính thưa chủ tòa đoàn um, xin phép được trả lời một cái câu hỏi uh, đó là mình có thêm nghiên cứu theo dõi tỷ lệ tử vong do mọi nguyên nhân không ạ? À? À, thì cái trong cái nghiên cứu mà 235 bệnh nhân này thì à, chủ yếu là cái nghiên cứu hồi cứu à, chúng tôi nghiên cứu ở cái thời điểm mà bệnh nhân à, từ lúc vào viện cho đến lúc mà ra viện thôi thì chỉ có cái tỷ lệ tử vong sớm trong quá trình phẫu thuật và tử vong ở trong giai đoạn hậu phẫu thì cái tử vong sớm ở đây là chủ yếu là do cái trong trong cái giai đoạn hậu phẫu thì chủ yếu là do cái nguyên nhân thứ nhất đó là cái tình trạng bệnh nhân nó rơi vào tình trạng gọi là suy tim cấp uh, sau khi mổ xong cái trong cái nhóm này thì cái chủ yếu là tử vong ở chúng ta đã tiến lường trước được những cái bệnh nhân rất nặng đó là những có những cái bệnh nhân nó suy tim đồ bốn hở ván động mạch chủ rất là nặng vào viện trong cái tình trạng nó suy tim toàn bộ nhưng mà cũng chấp nhận là vào một cái cuộc phẫu thuật thì trong cái tình trạng đó thì sau khi mổ xong thì nó diễn tiến rất là nặng suy tim rồi sau đó là đưa tới suy đa tạng và sau đó bệnh nhân nó tử vong trong cái bối cảnh của suy đa tạng còn những cái nghiên cứu mà cái tỷ lệ tử vong mà lâu dài thì hiện tại thì ở chúng mình đang có một cái nghiên cứu khác mà chắc cũng phải vài tháng nữa thì mới có được cái kết quả để mà thông báo với với các bạn ạ okay thank you very much So, dear um, professors and colleagues in Vietnam and Germany, that was a great um, session, and I want to thank all the presenters for their excellent uh, talks and all the colleagues for the interesting discussion. And now I want to close this session and looking forward to session eight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dạ, yeah, em chào anh Hùng. Dạ, anh Hùng. Chúc bài hãy nghe. Dạ, yeah, anh gặp anh Hùng. Yeah. So.
Okay, we are online now after this commercial. So dear uh, professors, colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me to continue to the session 